Stanford University. Today's class is on AI, machine learning, new algorithms and machines and connected devices. We have for our guest speaker today, Gilman Louie. He's a partner at Al Supply Partners and also a member of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. He's also the founder and former CEO of Vincutel, which is a strategic venture fund that was created to help enhance national security by connecting the U.S. intelligence community with startups. He previously started his career as a pioneer in the entertainment industry. His accomplishments include designing and developing the Falcon F-16 flight simulator. He's also the person who licensed Tetris, the world's most popular computer game that I'm sure all of you played growing up. So he licensed that from its developers in the Soviet Union. And Gilman's someone who I've had the privilege to work with for the last nine or so years. And he's one of the smartest and most thoughtful people I've ever met. Every time he gives a talk, I learn something new. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Linus to interview him and also lead today's session. So thank you. Thank you, Gilman. Thank you, Ernestine. Uh, Gilman, uh, I know Ernestine gave you a, an intro, but I'd love to know more about how you went from the entertainment industry to becoming a partner at Alsop Louie and then becoming a member of this committee on AI. Sure. You know, um, I spent my career in the video game industry, you know, did the classic startup thing, the raise money from Klein and Perkins and Excel partners, go public, then get bought. I was bought by Hasbro. Hasbro bought two of my companies. Uh, one company I was on the board on called Wizards of the Coast. They make a game called Magic the Gathering. And back in the day was the publisher, the Pokemon collectible card game. And, you know, my video game company. And so probably had up to that point, the best job I possibly could imagine. Uh, I was, uh, I became the chief creative officer for Hasbro Interactive. And if you are ever interested in what a chief creative officer does, a chief creative officer's best role is probably portrayed by Tom Hanks in the movie Big. <laughs> I used to walk around Hasbro and say, that toy sucks. <laughs> or you know, that toy is really, really hot. I remember seeing the Furby for the first time. I said, it's going to you know, just go explode all over the place. Um, so there was a situation where Fortune Magazine was doing a fly off of uh, kind of senior executive, former military pilots to see who was top gun. Back then, Fortune would do like kind of this testosterone thing, you know, who's the best golfer, who's the best motorcycle rider. It's kind of a, you know, kind of a fun piece that they would mix up, uh, you know, once a year in the publication. So they wanted to know who was top. So they called up Hasbro and, and said, do you have any foreign military pilots? And they said, no, but we did buy a video game company that does flight sims. And, and, and then editors said, oh, this is perfect, right? Video gamer versus fighter pilots, right? So, you know, they put me up in these kind of former trainers, uh, World War II trainers, like B-34s, and um, I ended up dogfighting first person I dogfighted it against was a former Vietnam vet, flew F-15s, a brigadier general. It was also an A-1 pilot in Vietnam, which is a patroller pilot, very similar to the T-34. And, you know, he ate my lunch. It was like, and I had a Top Gun pilot with me, and he, would, he ate his lunch too, right? So it's like, ate both of our lunches. But the next guy was the CEO of, of Bombardier from, from Canada, the big uh, airplane manufacturer, and he lost to me. So, and he was a former F-100 pilot for the Canadians. So the Americans gave him all sorts of grief. How could you lose to a video gamer? <laughs> but it turns out the person that I lost to uh, was also recruiting for the CIA for hydrogen struggles for this new position as CEO of Intel. And somebody took my videotape, my dogfight tape, uh, showed it around. The next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call to come to Washington, D.C. or to McLean, Virginia to go to the CIA, meet with the director, and the director is trying to talk me into taking this job. And I said, look, I, I love it. I'm really honored, right? This would be a really fantastic job, but you know, I already have a great job and I have a commitment to Hasbro because they bought, you know, one of my companies and I'm a board of another company just bought. And this director of CIA, George Tennant, leans over and goes, we got better toys than Hasbro. <laughs> so, so I joined it. I ended up joining to create this thing called Incutel, which was a venture capital fund. It was the first of its kind to actually invest on behalf of the U.S. government to find innovative technologies that were useful for uh, national security purposes. I mean, Incutel has a long and interesting history. I was fortunate to actually start that with this great 
board of trustees, including people like Bill Perry, um, you know, Bill, uh, former secretary of defense. You know, he led the whole CSAC program at Stanford. You know, Paul Kaminsky, who was the founder of the Stealth Fighter, you know, created that entire program. Then Augustine hit a black heed. You know, the former chairman of Goldman Sachs. I mean, he was the, the who's who trying to solve for this problem. And I did that for six years. Had a lot of great technologies come out of that and you know, things that we use every day today, you know, like you know, Google Maps, Google Earth, or companies that we originally invested in that, that Google bought. So we covered a whole spectrum of technology devices. In 2006, I left to create InQtel. I mean, my goal was to help the government set it up. Uh, I'm a startup kind of CEO. And once it was set up, you know, I, I felt it should be a lot like DARPA. You know, you do kind of your tour. And then before you go native, uh, you should, you know, go back into the regular commercial world. And I, I was beginning to sound more like a govy than a startup guy. And so I said, you know, it's time for me to, for this organization to get somebody who's, that can actually continue to grow this, but it's midlife in its career. And, you know, they hired a great, eventually brought on a guy by the name of Chris Darby who came from Intel. Chris has done a terrific job. So then I started my own venture fund with Stuart also. Stuart came from NEA before that was famous for running all the big conferences, you know, like the demo conference. There was a conference back in the nineties called Agenda that really kind of brought together the whole industry. So that, you know, that got me to from, you know, toys and games to national security to running my own venture fund. And then finally, because I continue to do work with the U.S. government as a volunteer, we call them like special government employees. I was working with the Department of Defense on innovation as a part of an advisor to the Defense Innovation Board, the DIB. And when the AI Commission got formed, Commerce, the president had three appointees, Congress uh, had 12 appointees. I turned, I became one of the president's, one of his three appointees to the Commerce Department. Uh, and he chose me because he wanted somebody who understood startups, understood technologies, understood national security. And, you know, there's only a handful of us who have done kind of all of that and I was really honored to be asked to do it and so that's why I joined. Nice. Man, that's quite a story and I, I wish I told uh, when my mom scolded me for playing too many video games. I should have <laughs> told her that <laughs> one day. It's going to lead me to become on this commission but uh, that's great. So I, I the, the class has read the report, the, the media report. I think you had one that I just saw was released in April but I guess the big question is how close are we to building artificial general intelligence and what are your thoughts on it? We're far away, like far away. Um, there's, uh, it will require us to have multiple miracles on a regular basis to get us there. It doesn't mean that we can't use AI. I mean, we're using AI all over the place today that will increase our productivity to do limited functions like autonomous driving, um, you know, to fly drones, to do sequencing. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that AI can either augment human intelligence with, or actually take over and, and approach problems in a very different way than ways humans are. And, you know, I think the holy grail of general AI and that is defined by having a machine think like a human misses the point. We got plenty of humans who think like humans, yeah. you know? <laughs> so it's like, why don't we have machines think like machines and figure out how man and machine can actually work together for the benefit of the world rather than, you know, trying to mimic more of us. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that we're doing today, as advanced as it is, you know, you think deep learning, right, or GANs or any one of the other kind of approaches, when you really think about it, it's pretty crude, right? It's, you know, fundamentally, you know, I don't want to overly simplify it, but, you know, it's in some ways, an advanced statistical approach to, to, to sure. make the decision making. And it's, it's highly useful because it can find patterns that we humans naturally miss because, you know, our brains are wired differently. But that's far from general intelligence. Right, right. And in, in, uh, in that report, I think one of the seven principles that was to form the commission was to make America to be a global leader in AI. And in a previous class around AI ethics, we learned about the trade-offs between privacy and the need for these algorithms to 
have a lot of information to be as accurate as possible. And you can argue that privacy is one of a core tenant or, or principles for uh, Americans versus countries with different cultures like China, for example, who are less concerned about privacy. So how do you how do you see us balancing those needs? And does a country like China have a uh, just unfair advantage in developing better AI than us? Well, you know, it depends, right? It depends on how you approach your problem. If you believe that the future will continue to be deep learning, right? And that we had to have, you know, exquisite data on everybody's actions so that we can model that, maybe. You know, it was kind of interesting. I, you know, I spent some time with the European Union's uh, kind of AI leadership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, we asked them the same questions. We just kind of said, you know, hey, you know, does, does pri your version of privacy put you at a disadvantage to the U.S. and to China, right? Because, you know, the U.S. is kind of in the middle. Yep. You know, our version of privacy, you think total privacy, it's kind of privacy from government versus privacy from commercial versus the European is privacy, privacy, right? And, you know, the Europeans said, look, if we crack the code on how to do AI and to protect people's privacy, we come out ahead of you guys. So they're taking it from a different approach, which means that they're going to go after potentially models that aren't relied on exquisite, personally identified pieces of information to train itself, right? And they're, you know, for example, you can use simulations and, uh, and modeling techniques that doesn't require the collection of data. You need to collect enough data to model, but once you got the models down, you may not need that PII. And so, whereas China may have a short-term advantage because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're focused on social good, which is a higher priority than personal good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes us in America kind of mix that up. Like they're, you know, there's an argument that says they're evil because that's what they do. But if you understand the history of China, you can understand for 3,000 years why they're, you know, social good for country stability for them is more important than personal privacy. Whereas for us, that's a foundational kind of argument. But then if China's AI can only work on PII, then it's not particularly useful in a place like Europe right. or in a place like the US. So it's, a, you know, it's an interesting starting point. And each kind of thought leaderships in each one of these kind of lead or communities of interest are going to tackle the problems in a different way. And I actually think that's good. That diversity of ideas that, you know, the, you know, what are the rules of the road of, you know, what's socially acceptable, what's not socially acceptable. You know, the DIB, Defense Innovation Board, put out a piece on what they believe are, are the, for, for the Department of Defense on socially responsible use for AI. Now, Culturally, that's different. I, I, I didn't. I think a lot of people didn't expect the U.S. Department of Defense to actually publish a document like that. Versus, you know, China kind of looked at it and go, "Oh my God, the Americans are doing this now. We got to do it." So, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting starting place, and and I'm pretty excited by the thought leaders on the commission trying to think through all the variants of the challenges ahead. How to, you know, for lots of reasons, we want the U.S. leadership and its view of you know, appropriate uses of AI to be part of how society on a global level views how this stuff should be used. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. And how are ways I guess we can work globe to your point on globally, uh, given all these different philosophies over you know the differences on privacy and and culture. Like, how are there ways that we can bridge that gap between everybody? But at some level, at some point, you know, depending on social constructs. Yeah. You may never bridge the gap, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, um, you might not bridge the gap on facial recognition, acceptable uses of facial recognition. You, right. You're not going to convince the Chinese not to use it, and you're not going to convince San Francisco to use it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's <laughs> and, and that's okay. I mean, that again, that I mean, the, it, it, it fits the norms of the society that it is in. But there are lots of things globally that we could be using AI on, like cracking the coronavirus, right? I mean, AI has helped us and, you know, uh, massive compute has helped us reduce the time to get to a smaller set of test solutions that we're after. And the, the uses of that kind of AI and being able to share that on a global scale as you're all trying to solve the same class of problem is a good use of AI, right? Mm -hmm. If on the flip side, if 
you know, like the old war games movie, we decide that we want to give AI launch codes and make first strike decisions. I think that would be really, really bad for the world. Right. And so there, you know, I think there are areas in which all countries, whether they're competitors in the United States or not, can agree on inappropriate uses of AI. We should figure out what those boundaries are. There are clearly not just appropriate uses, really good uses of AI that we all should like double down on. Then every country then needs to figure out, you know, in its own social context, what is acceptable uses of this new class of technology on everything from education to the workforce, to how we think about labor, to national security, even rules of conduct in war, all of that, right it's unwritten right now and right. the commission is like a first attempt to get some principles down and some strategies that is going to get you know the world into a better place over the next literally the next 30 years of development around ai mm -hmm. yeah. yep i hear you so on that note too what are some of the more recent developments i know AGI is, is very far away but what are some of the more recent developments in ai in the field of ai that let's say in the last year that really excite you or maybe even really scares you? Well, you know, it takes a little while for this stuff to really stick, right? Mm -hmm. so everything looks promising 10 minutes into it. Uh, so I'll go, I'll, I'll, set, I'll reset your question to more recent uses of AI. You know, yep. I'm very impressed on the uses of, uh, you know, GANs, you know, adversarial networks approaches for training up systems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more than just the ability to have a machine beat a goal player, right? AlphaGo is a good example of that, right? I was particularly taken on how the AlphaGo team applied the algorithms to play chess more than Go. And chess, you can argue, is a simple mm -hmm. game. But what was outstanding that was totally surprising is that, you know, the computer science around teaching a computer how to play chess, it's been around for 50 years, right? And... You know, if you take a look at an advanced computer program like Stockfish, it really is the, you know, the culmination of all of that experience, right? And so Stockfish has been exquisitely programmed with chess experts and computer scientists and taking all of the lessons of chess that humans have developed over the last, at least, a couple hundred years on chess play and all the databases of all the major competitions all rolled into this program and and we thought that's it right we're, we're, we're at the peak and, and maybe it can play better by adding better hardware but it's a pretty complete model on how to crush any other system on playing chess you know alpha Bo comes along teaches itself chess in four hours and proceed to crush stockfish a hundred to zero okay. and you got you got to ask yourself and, and then when the what was interesting was when the experts reviewed how AlphaGo was playing chess it was using these concepts that some of these concepts that haven't been used in chess for 30 or 40 years you know and in some cases 100 years a very aggressive style of play that just blew out all the conventional wisdoms around chess now, chess is a relatively straightforward game, simple rules, 64 squares, you know, standard number of pieces. But that surprised all of us, right? And if you, if you look at adversarial network designs, still a relatively simple application of technology, you know, AI and statistical technologies, that became a game changer, right? It, it was more than just simply waking up China because Go beat a Go player. But it, from a computer science point of view, was, it was really, really important uh, a series of events. The other thing that, that I'm really trying to follow much more interesting is the use of more computer modeling as a way to train systems. So you think about us humans, and I know it's always a danger of mapping biology too closely to computer science, but just bear with me for a second, right? Um, so we spend our, all of our lives in our frontal lobes and even our brain stems training up our little brains uh, to operate in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And so think of, of a computer system sensing the world, collecting all the data on, you know, two thirds of the time awake. And then we go and, you know, we sleep. Now, don't quite understand why we dream, lots of theories. <laughs> but 
if we use that dream time as a computer science and say, now we're going to put simulation and put wild parameters into our simulation and run it while the computer is dreaming to train up itself for the next day, it's not that different than how Waymo uses simulation to simulate those edge cases mm -hmm. to test out their new algorithms to apply it the next day. So, so I think there's lots of fascinating work that's happening in the, the, the development of kind of specialized AI. And what's exciting is how groups of experts and teams, and quite frankly, the open source nature of AI, for all practical purposes, mostly open, because everybody shares everything, you know, how fast this thing is moving. So it is exciting, and we're going to learn a lot over the next decade. And then you add in the changes in microelectronics, and, you know, eventually, if we get to a place where we get enough qubits strung together to make a general purpose a quantum computer, you put that together with AI, advanced sensors, next generation sensing systems, better understanding of biology and kind of hybrid biological and digital systems. There's lots of places we can go to develop new ways of having thinking machines. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what about what, what scares you? I know this, in this report, there's a lot of things that the, the US govern, government needs to work on, but Specifically in like AI technology, like deep play, uh, deep fakes or job loss through automation, are there any particular things that really worry you about the future of AI? Well, I think there needs to be human context around AI, and if we don't do a good job, we can actually, for a period of time, do a lot of harm. Right? I mean, it, there is a danger that if you just use unsupervised learning, that machines arrive at patterns that are in the data, but the data is already biased, right? Mm -hmm. On how we collect it and how we classify it and how we use it. So an example I gave a couple of years ago to the American Bar Association about the uses of AI is it's very easy for an algorithm to do, you know, our version, computer versions of redlining, right? Right. Because, yeah. because, because inherent in the way we collect the data and classify it, and then we, the way we ask it questions, it comes back with an answer that's reflective of our own human biases. Now we take the speed of com computation and we throw computer speed at it, and then we use the network effect to spread it. Then we have this sometimes human bias that, you know, after a while, it's, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, where we get those disclaimers when you go to a website or you buy a piece of software, you know, it's 34 pages of disclaimers, right? And on the warranty, yeah. you get just get to the point where you just keep scrolling down to the end to click the button, right? The danger is we become what I call the data monkey, where the computer is telling the humans what to, when to hit the button to get the piece of candy or, or the food, rather than us supervising the computers. So there is a um, whole field of study around the human effects, the kind of human psychological framework in which we design these systems for, right? these human factors. And on, in the role of AI, I don't think we've done enough of that work. It's kind of been a kind of a lost art for a while. Um, and we need to kind of dust off the books on human factors design and put in some of these new AI concepts you know, the most dangerous place to be in the car is when you're trusting the AI and the AI is trusting you. And so both sides, the, the top autonomous system thinks you're paying attention and you're thinking, I don't need to pay attention because the sensor is paying attention. And then there's this gap when the bad new, you know, that one edge case comes along and, you know, you just go right into the divide. Why? Yeah. Because you were depending on it and it was depending on you. And you probably would have been much better off if it, was, if it was only you or only the AI. But having that kind of in-between situation can lead to consequences that are surprising and sometimes dangerous. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. I, I, have a, I have a Tesla and sometimes I, I put on self-driving mode, even though it's not really self-driving mode. And uh, it gets me into a lot of trouble sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I start checking out and yeah, and then that case where that Apple engineer died because he wasn't paying attention and hit that divide is really sad. But I guess on that note, do you, I guess one, one question I really want to know from you is 
there was a certain, I feel, expectation of AI maybe a few years ago where it would completely change our lives. I mean, we're talking about level five autonomy, self-driving cars, and we had a class on that last session. It really hasn't come to fruition and it probably won't be around for a long time. So the expectations really far outweigh the reality right now. And so what are your thoughts on whether we're headed for another AI winter? There was, uh, the class has read a little bit about the, the history of AI, and there's been several AI winters where the technology isn't there to allow the AI to develop and, and you just hit this barrier. So where do you think we're going in terms of the future of AI? Well, I think there are going to be peaks and valleys. It's going to go like this. Sure. But we're going to be going up, right? And then there'll be periods of unreasonable expectations followed by disappointment. But each point where we end up at a point of disappointment will be higher than the place that we start. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't think that's going to stop. It's sort of like, now some of you may be too young for this, right? It's sort of like, you know, in 1969, when we planted the flag on the moon. It was expected that it would only take us 10 years to go to Mars, right? Because it was like, okay, we go to the moon. We did that in 10 years. Well, let's go to Mars in 10 years. The prediction of us going to Mars was correct. The time frame was wrong. We will eventually get to Mars. I think a lot of the predictions around AI will happen. It's just going to take longer and it's not going to be linear and it's going to be sporadic. And there will be revolutionary breakthroughs and great levels of disappointment. But, you know, it's sort of like it will affect our lives. I mean, just like microprocessors have affect our lives. And, you know, I remember there was a point in time where people were saying, man, we got to, you know, the U.S. has to be a leader of flat panel displays because if we're not a leader of flat panel displays, you know, the world's going to come to an end, right? Well, it turns out flat dis panels displays are everywhere, right? You know, pockets mm -hmm. and screens and stuff, and it allows us to deal with this virus the way we've been doing it. Except it just becomes susceptible. It just gets woven into our life, and it, it's sort of like, of course, right? I mean, my kids kind of go, you know, what, you know, they don't understand the concept of, you know, three, three ABC, CBS, and NBC as your three only places to get information. They, they, don't, they can't imagine that world because, you know, that was the world that I grew up in. So I, I think in the next generation is going to have AI all around them, but it's not going to be that big of a deal. Now, when AI begins to have massive displacement, and it will, the question is how gradual would it be? versus how radical. I mean, yeah. I mean, I remember the time when the first ATM machine showed up and Cebo was saying, oh, this is, no, this is not gonna affect tellers. This is not gonna affect branch banking. That's not gonna go, this is this so that you can get money out, you know, in, in the middle of the night, right? And it'd be on for spot uses, for kind of emergency uses, not, you know, and, it, and no, they were wrong. You know, most branches of banks have, closed down because you don't need them mm -hmm. uh, other than for old people who sometimes need to go and visit to have somebody to talk to right and there's a community function that branch banks have but but not at the same level it was back in the 70s or 80s so right. there will be a displacement of labor the question is it will be a gradual or will it be a radical there are certain sectors that are going to be affected in the usual ways that we haven't experienced before i mean there are a lot of white collar jobs that will turn out to be not necessarily requires human interaction. I mean, do we really need humans to do bookkeeping? Do we really need, you know, for 80% or 90% of the legal profession, do we need that many lawyers that can do filing the briefs and filling out the, the you know, the IP patent applications? You know, the machines can do that pretty well. Do, you know, there's lots of stuff doctors do today that, you know, a machine can actually, AI can actually do better. It doesn't mean that we don't need any doctors. Yeah. We won't need as many of them. And so, you know, this is going to affect a white collar generation uh, much differently and in some ways more, more unexpectedly than what was currently contemplated. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree that there, the trends will eventually get there to where our expectations meet the reality. And the question is whether how radical that's going to be. I guess from your, your research with the commission and all the work you've been doing, is that, a, I mean, is, is your gut, it's going to be a radical change or a gradual change? It'll come in spurts. Okay. You know, it'll affect different 
countries and different segments of the population differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, I was very impressed with some countries. In one country, uh, Japan has a very thoughtful kind of whole of society view on AI. And you know, you can go to the Japanese website and you know, and, and read some of the literature that the Japanese have adopted. You know, they think about how AI could positively. You know, Japan has different issues than we have. Right? They have an aging population. They're at, they're at almost full utilization of the workforce. Granted. They haven't used the female workforce as much as, as you know, other countries, but in their social norms, they feel like they're close at the limit, right? And you know, how does Japan continue to be competitive? How do we train our young people? We have an aging population. How do we take care of the aging? And so they incorporate the AI into kind of a whole of society approach. Everything from cradle to grave, how AI can affect their society and what they have to do, very concrete, implementable strategies that their government is going to do with AI. Right? So they're taking a much broader approach for AI than perhaps we are in terms of, of you know, how to think about it as a national strategy. Remember, our work is going to focus around national security. And yes, that includes things like economic security and competition and something like that. But it's you know, a very different approach. I'm not saying theirs is better than ours. This is different, right? Whereas the Chinese is, you know, we will come up, we're committed to AI, we will match the West by 2025, we will be more advanced than them by 2035. It's a very competitive model approach. Mm -hmm. uh, so interesting. It's just interesting. It's different. It depends yeah. on the social constructs of one country. Yeah. Where do you see AI ML, ML thriving in a way that isn't right now? In what fields does AI have the most potential? Well, I, I think is in places where there's an unbelievable amount of data and an inability to process it, right? Mm -hmm. I think we got a long ways to go in medicine and biology. And pharma, I think AI is going to have a major, major impact in that. There's still, as, as, as we're living today, right, in our, locked up in our homes, social distancing. As much as we know about biology, we don't know very much. <laughs> right? Yep. So, so I, think, I, I think that that's one area. I think the other area is when I combine principles of machine learning to design and manufacturing, right? Uh, especially advanced forms of manufacturing. So if I can change the economic value of the ability to manufacture something repeatedly for cheap to the ability to manufacture what you want for cheap and deliver it to you at point of consumption, that's going to be a radical change. So what I try to tell people is it's the combination of AI and machine learning together with other breakthroughs. It by itself moves the ball a certain distance, but the revolution is when you have multiple advances in different disciplines coming together in which AI becomes a accelerant, kind of a catalyst of, you know, very rapid change and, you know, major impact on society and, and the human state. So Gilman, your experience has span both the private and public sector. In a previous class, we debated the role of each in AI. And so I'd love to hear your perspectives. And for example, should government be regulating AI more? You know, this, this is a tough question, right? I mean, it's uh, what do we mean by regulating? You know, in fact, I, I was having a conversation with several other AI experts just earlier today on this. You know, I think if you just think about the structure of regulations, you know, regulations is kind of the, the legal construct of what is acceptable norms for a country, a local government, a state. You know, we, we create this kind of regulatory body of knowledge that kind of like think of these as our version of programming, right? <laughs> of saying, you know, these are the boundaries of acceptable yeah. behavior. Right? And, and it is done in a way where, in some ways, it's hard to be nuanced. And that's why we have you know, great legal scholars to do that level of interpretation and, and uses. Now, when you apply it to AI, the, the issue is you know, how 
it isn't so much the AI, but how the what's how's it being used, right? Mm -hmm. so, so some people are saying, oh, you know, we need to have trade restrictions on AI. But what does that mean? Are you going to like have like restrictions on the algorithms, given that most of the algorithms and approaches are open source, shared among academics? Is it data specific, right? Is it like Okay, well, we know the EU has very strong data restrictions. We know China has very strong data restrictions. We kind of don't have strong data restrictions, right? Because um, we look at data completely differently. And then applications, like when can you use AI and how much of it can be used against a certain application for a certain purpose? So these are all really tough questions and you got to put it back in the context of the domain in which you're asking the question. So a general purpose, should AI have, be regulated? The answer is yes. Certain parts of AI should be regulated. We should probably make sure that AI is not used to be more effective to create you know, cyber breaches, mm -hmm. right? But we already have rules about cyber, you know, cyber theft, right? <laughs> so, so again, is, is if AI is a catalyst, when, do you add a catalyst that suddenly, simply by the act of adding that catalyst changes the outcome from something that is acceptable to something that is no longer acceptable? Right. So, so you have to have that kind of framework as you think through these problem sets. Right. Given the number of white collar jobs that require basic skills are likely to disappear, what should people learn? What should we or what should we not be teaching? Well, um, this is an interesting debate that I have around my table. I have a 15 year old and a 17 year old, two high schoolers. So, you know, it's the classic, <laughs> why am I le learning this stuff that has gone on for about 200 years, right? <laughs> or at least hundred years, because high school has only been around for hundred years. So, look, the premium isn't on knowledge. The premium is gonna be on the ability to apply knowledge in a creative way. In a, in a human way that is uniquely human and to be able to live in that scene between the dance between machine intelligence and human intelligence to produce something of surprising good and value. And the reason why I say it like that is, you know, you think about the SAT test, right? Which is our way of socially, you know, racking and stacking our population. I mean, a lot of debate whether or not testing you know, the value of testing, particularly of the social biases that are, are in, is in tests even today. Even though as much as we try to get it out of there, it's still obviously in there. Because you can do better on the SAT and mathematics because you can go in with a four-function calculator and solve the problem better than somebody else with a four-function calculator. When in reality, you know, I can just take a picture of the equation on my phone and get to the answer that, and anybody can do the same thing or I can regurgitate, uh, I can take a particular prose, run it through Grammarly and have great grammar, and even edit and improve my writing, using a little bit of AI behind that. Are those the ways we should be deciding who has certain privileges or not? Whereas an artist who takes some machines, you know, I have a maker lab down in my, in my house now that has pretty much every piece of equipment known to mankind, right? You know, you know I got a, you know, my latest toy is, you know, uh, a laser cutter that, that is a home kind of laser cutter, right? I have a fabric cutter that can cut cloth and, you know, I got an email that came to me by the, the company who makes it called Cricut asked, with a goal saying, we're going to make 2 million masks using a machine. So everybody who owns this machine, can you help make some masks, right? I mean, that idea of creatively taking advantage of machines and intelligence to socially network for social good is now a new capability that, that didn't exist even 10 years ago, right? If, it, if somebody said, hey, let's go make a, a million masks, you know, like our federal government and state governments are still trying to figure out how to do. <laughs> you, you look at the do-it-yourself movement of, you know, we're going to go help our hospitals. We're not going to wait for the Chinese to clear their certification of medical PPE equipment, we're gonna make it ourselves because we can. 
Now, fast forward 10 years from now, when this stuff is in everybody's hands, you start thinking about the application, the knowledge, and what knowledge really is, really is putting the human qualities around leveraging these tools to do better good. It shouldn't be just about replacing. You know, it's sort of like we used to have typing pools in the 50s where you had a whole career based on the fact that you could type 90 words or 100 words a minute versus only 60 words a minute, right? And all that human capital to do typing, right? That, that human capital gets redeployed. The problem is, is in that transition between what was and what's going to be. And that's those periods of pain. And we as governments and society have to figure out how to make that as pain-free, as smooth as possible. So the premium is gonna be the ability to acquire new skills quickly, the ability to leverage technologies in a creative way to solve real problems. And you know, my prediction though, a number of people disagree with me is, we're gonna end up in a place where the work week is probably gonna be 20 to 25 hours at some point in the future. I don't know if it's gonna be 10 years from now or 50 years from now, but we're not gonna be working 40 hour work weeks because we're not gonna need to, right? Right. Remember weekends was an invention. We didn't even have weekends a hundred years ago. We just made that up. And now it's part of the social norm. So it's it's gonna be, you know, kind of a really interesting period in in governments and society needs to think very carefully about how do we transition our workforce, how we learn, how we play, how we interact in this new age of all these new technologies, including AI, is going to impact in the world. Yep. No, I agree. I kind of feel actually with this shelter in place, I only work 20 hours a week these days. And you're probably more productive, by the way. That's I am that, very productive. Right. I, you know, I have companies who said, you know, we produced more in the last month than we did in the last two years because I don't have to go to a meeting. I don't have to sit in traffic and I don't have to deal with my boss. Right. Right. I mean, so, so I no, think true. People, people are going to learn a lot in this process. <laughs> and, you know, work is definitely going to change. Yeah. We need, do it, need AI to have that happen to us. Just, you know, right. What other emerging technologies do you expect to be the greatest enabler of wider spread use of AI, ML? I, I think pharma, specialized medicines, right, that are very targeted to each individual. To be able to do that, we, we have to scan you, we have to be able to analyze you, we have to be able to run the models of you in a way that we can then appropriately give you the right kinds of uh, medications and prescriptions and cocktails. We're a long ways from that, but when we get there, that's gonna be transformative, right? If you think about the fact that we might be able to add 20 years to everybody's life expectancy, now, that could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing if it's done wrong, right? But that's going to change society if people are living in an extra 20 years on average. Yep. Biologically, we can't. Yeah. These AI chips that are emerging or quantum computers or better algorithms. What do you think that will be? What of those technologies do you think will be the greatest enabler for better or more wider spread use of AI everywhere? Uh, microelectronics, clearly, right? Mm-hmm. And microelectronics covers everything from the sensor Okay. Uh, itself to how much compute can we bring close to the ability of sensing and then how much data can we network with trust to the next system right because mm-hmm. intelligence uh, you know the kind of the hive intelligence is a strategy that works pretty well when you have um, you, when you don't have general intelligence but you have specialized intelligence right right so, and so that really gets down to silicon and the next thing that replaces silicon. Uh, right. So, right. So we're down at seven nanometers right now. There are three companies in the world that can do seven nanometer fabs, right? TSMC, Samsung, and Intel, right? Mm-hmm. As you go from seven to three and then maybe into new materials or into quantum, quantum could be a game changer in compute. Right. Right. And, and so suddenly things that we couldn't compute because this took too long can now be crushed almost instantaneously for certain categories of computation. And let's say that that is 
under 20 years off. In other words, let's say we can get the general quantum computer that nobody in the world can afford except for nation states in 10 to 15 years. And let's say between 20 and 30 years, we can get it down to, you know, the cost of a MacBook Pro or, you know, a laptop or an iPhone. Then it's going to be like, woohoo, that's a completely different world in, in AI. Right. No, I agree. It's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of scary if you think about it, but it could come very quickly. How can we use AI to reduce systematic inequalities in society and not exasperate them? Well, we... <laughs> We can throw deep learning against the data that we have collected and to find bias, sure. right? right. So, so we, can, we can work with social scientists and you know, big, you know, and, and data experts to look for patterns of unnatural, non-random data sets that might indicate signals of bias. Right. No different than trying to figure out, you know, what's a MIG in this photo. It's, it's the same kind of approach. Uh, you just got to train your system on what is bias and what isn't bias. And I think if social scientists wanted to do that. We can, we can do that on election fraud or election, the other side of election, which is inaccessible to people's ability to vote. Right, this is clearly there are some places in the country which is much harder to vote than others. We can think about how loans are given out, right? Whether or not it's balanced or not, or even how universities admit students. That's all within the, the realm of our abilities to do today. We don't need next generation algorithms mm -hmm. to do it. We just need mm -hmm. motivated people and motivated social scientists to say, we should do that, right? We should mm -hmm. use these machines to make society more, at least for, for the U.S., that you know, equal opportunity and and making sure that everybody has a fair shot and fairness is a guiding principle to AI that's being deployed in the United States. Okay, so is the next arms race for AI weapons? I think in the in your report, in your commission report, you you talked about the danger of weaponized AI. Uh, what, what I'd love to get your thoughts on on that general subject. I think at some point the world has to just like with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, or with anti-personnel mines, or with cluster bombs, or with weaponizing space, has to agree where the red lines are. Now, we might not totally agree on the gray lines, but we should have red lines, right? Mm -hmm. Because here's the problem that, you know, you get a natural escalation that takes place. You have, let's say you, you decide to build a weapon system that, that abides by your ethical principles. And your adversary says, I know what your ethical principles is, and I'm going to flip it to my advantage. I'm going to have a system, as you have a person on the loop or in the loop, my system is not. So my system is going to think faster than you, and then you're going to die. Then what are you going to do? Are you going to, like, suddenly suspend your rules to fight them, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get this kind of race condition that takes place, and you get an arms race. Right? That's how right. almost all arms race happens. In many cases, arms race happens because of the perception of what your adversary is doing, not what they really are doing. I mean, like right. the missile gap or the bomber gap. Turns out we really didn't have one, but we thought. In fact, the other side wanted us to believe there was a gap so that we would overspend, right, and try to chase something that, that, that they didn't really have and use that tit for tat. Look, in national defense and warfare, you're always going to have some level of that. But you got to make sure you don't get yourself in the race state situation that you end up like war games, right? Mm -hmm. where, where, you know, you're the monkey on the keyboard, right? Waiting for the little light to go across the screen. And when it does, you press the button. We have to make sure that, that there are some acceptable global norms on how we do this. And responsible countries, mm -hmm. I think, want to do this, I think, but nobody wants to take the first step. What is an example of something like a red line that it cannot be crossed? First strike. An AI, oh, so AI cannot initiate a first strike. It has to be a human in the loop to initiate yeah, it. I, I think that's something that, uh, you know, nuclear weapons, I think all countries should get together and, set, and commit to no AI first strike. Now, that's a personal opinion. I can't speak sure. to my commissioners, and all of this is my personal <laughs> opinion, but I'm a strong believer in. Right. If we're going to decide the end of the world, I'm not going to let the machine do it for me. 
<laughs> That's good. So some suggest artificial intelligence can take overtake humanity by 2045. So in about, what is that, 25 years-ish. And that was the mean prediction by a panel or survey of machine learning experts. What is your prediction of when AI will overtake humanity? Well, first of all, it depends what you define <laughs> as overtake, right? Like, uh, when, if you define it as when machines decide humans are no longer necessary in the world, that's a different <laughs> kind of overtake. Clearly, machines will continue in certain capabilities to improve at a point that will be better than what humans can do without machines. Right. 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 And there is a debate whether machines can do better than machines with humans. Right. Mm -hmm. Gary Kasparov is a big believer in machines with humans are better than machines by themselves or human by themselves. So the Alpha Go versus Stockfish example didn't quite prove that out. I mean, you can interpret that in a lot of different ways. I would say that's, in a general sense, highly optimistic mm. on, on terms of time frame and highly pessimist, pessimistic in terms of what defines machines being better than humans. Machines should do things that machines do really, really well. And humans have one advantage. Humans, you know, are very adaptive. Now, when will we get to general AI to the point where machines can be as adaptive as we? It will happen. But again, you know, at the end of the day, we have to decide, you know, what's the limits and what's, what are, what's the trade space between having a machine do it and our human do it. Yeah. So you think it's going to be over... You you take the, you take the over. I definitely uh, over. <laughs> right. by any Please. definition of what you define as better, with the exception of playing video games, right? I will I, I do predict that humans will no longer be able to beat AI driven adversaries by twenty thirty five. That the machines will always crush humans, right? In other words, all you League of Legend players out there, or Dota <laughs> users, you're toast. <laughs> In fact, that probably will happen by about twenty thirty. <laughs> 20 right. Great. Okay. Well, I'll call you in 25 years and we'll see <laughs> if, you're, if you're right.